black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Sunday night, here we go. I can't wait. Uh, We'll be talking to Rob, and Rob had an encounter in Georgia, a very recent encounter when he was face-to-face with one of these things, and it sure seemed interested in his gun uh, that he was holding at the time. And then we'll talk to Howard, and Howard had an encounter in Oklahoma. Had to stop and think about it for a second. Uh, Howard had an encounter in Oklahoma when he was younger, And uh, he saw this quote-unquote man uh, walking across his grandfather's property, and it turned out not quite to be a man. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Next week, I'll be in Texas, and I can't wait. Can't wait to go down there and... and, uh, meet everyone for the live show we're actually doing a meet and greet and it's up on the blog now if you want more information Uh, but we'll we'll be driving from houston to dallas and it'll be myself tony merkel from the confessionals and bob gimlin uh, doing a meet and greet a night of fun hope you guys can make it if you missed friday's show i had doug on and he was talking about i called it terror on the job site and it's probably one of the more terrifying encounters i've heard in a long time a great, great encounter. I want to thank Doug again for coming on. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Rob to the show. Rob, thanks for coming on. Thank you. No, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. And this encounter took place in Georgia, didn't it, Rob? That's correct. Uh, kind of south, central Georgia, uh, and around the uh, Telfair County area, which is which most people who are interested in fishing and all would know that's where the world's record bass was first caught around 19, I think around 1930, 23 or something like that. I'm not exactly sure on the date, but George Perry caught the fish. I mean, it weighed 22 pounds, two ounces, which, I mean, held the record for many, many years. I mean, up until here recently where a Japanese fella, caught the uh new world's record but yeah it held the record for a long time i gotcha i gotcha well if you would take us back to your encounter what were you doing and uh walk us into what happened okay well just to give you a kind of a short you know uh to what led up to this i i had uh moved here to telfair County around 2015 and I uh, married a lady here who was from here. Shortly after that, my sister had uh, developed breast cancer. And she had had the operations and the augmentation on her breast. And 
me and her were very, real close because she had uh my dad had raised both of us in a little town not far south of here called Roberta, which is central Georgia. He, we I, we had grew up there all our lives and uh we were just real close and uh dad died in oh nine and then Lee developed this and we just, you know, felt sure she was gonna beat it and felt good about it. And then in two thousand sixteen it came back and we found out it was on her brain. It just really put, you know, everybody involved, the family what was left and uh, I was really going through a hard time and I was right there with her up until she passed away in 2017. It was, it was just real bad on us all. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, she, I mean, she told me, she said, you know, I'm dying and and, you know, it, it, it just, it really, you know, got to me. I just never really, accepted it you know until we put her in the ground on august the 17th of 2017 shortly after that i'm you know really going through a lot of trouble with that and i mean it's causing a lot of problems i mean you can imagine the strain on a marriage and i'm i'm you know i'm kind of i'm the kind of person i just i kind of deal with things myself and when i really need to speak out like i'm doing now I didn't, and, you know, it, 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 it put a strain on my marriage, and I was going through that, and anyway, a buddy of mine called me from back home, and, he, you know, he's talking to me and trying to help me through this, and he told me, he said, man, he said, look, he said, I know down there where you're at, there's a lot of good hunting, and it was shortly after deer season in uh, 2000. 19 february of 2019 it'd been a little over a year since her death and he said why don't you go scout us out a place and we'll go we'll go hog hunting you know deer season's over with and is it you know that's the wma down there close to the river and it was so i told him i would and i if everything's correct it was on a sunday in 2019 in February. I think it was around the third, second or third week of February. It was around my birthday because I was born on February the 19th. And uh, I went down to the WMA, uh, close to where the World's Records Basel was called. I mean, I don't have no problem telling nobody about where it was. I mean, that's where it was. I had went in there we it stopped at the back gate the one that went down to the public landing and and uh i had my dog with me and uh he was running around there you know we had started out toward where i thought the lake was i wasn't even sure i'd never been to the lake i just was going in the direction where i had you know heard it was i was getting pretty close to where i thought it should be and my dog went missing I mean, he just, you know, went missing. And I tried to call him, and he was nowhere around. So I kind of walked on, really looking for him. And I could see gleaming of water up ahead of me. And I figured that, you know, that either had to be the lake or some part of it. And as I got closer to it, uh, I started to smell something. It, it was, it was, like something dead you know the first thing that i thought when i smelt it it was it was dead and as i got closer to the water and I, i'm not quite in view of it yet but i can i can see the sun gleaming off of it it was definitely water i it 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 got stronger and uh as i approached it i mean i'm looking around because it's so strong at that point to where I mean, I ought to be on it. Whatever it is, I ought to be seeing whatever it is. That's what I'm thinking. And the first thing I'm thinking is, well, maybe, you know, deer season's just gone out. Maybe somebody's killed something. And it's, you know, I've always heard animals go into water, you know, to, to uh, uh, when they get hit or whatever. And I'm looking real close around. And all of a sudden, I catch a glimpse of something to the right of me 
I mean, it's nothing automatic, you know. I just I just kept a glimpse of something. It's kind of like a bird, you know, fluttering. And as I turn and look, about 80 feet away, there's this object standing beside this tree, like a gum tree or a walnut tree, which are they're quite prevalent down here, you know, in the south. And I look. And I'm not really catching any, uh, nothing's registering to me about, you know, what I'm looking at. And all of a sudden, I catch movement. And as I focus in, I look and it's, it's around where the lips would be of something, you know, at this angle. And I'm still not quite sure about what I'm looking at. And as I look at it, I'm kind of quartering toward it, and I had a gun with me. I mean, I always, you know, when I go scouting, I I take a gun with me. And I had it kind of behind my right leg, you know, hanging lateral to my body. And I'm looking at it, and it's, when I realize what it is, it's the lips of this being standing there. I mean, he's kind of moving his lips like he's chewing on something. And when I realize, you know, what I'm looking at, I kind of step back. And when I did, my gun came kind of actually beside me instead of right behind my leg. And he's automatically, and that's when I knew that it was something because his eyes went directly to that gun. I mean, he just, boom, went to that gun. And then I realized, what in the hell am I looking at? I mean, what is this? He's looking at me. He he goes back to me. I realize then he's looking at me. And I don't have the best eyesight in the world. I mean, I should, you know, have glasses. But it was close enough that I could distinguish him looking at me and him looking at that gun. I mean, he knew what that gun was. And I'm like, oh, my God, what in the hell am I looking at? I, I Instinctively, I kind of knew, but I didn't want to, you know, I, did, I didn't ever. It, it was kind of a, just an all of a sudden moment. He kept looking at that gun and looking at me, and I don't know why I did it. I, I, to this day, I don't know why I did it. But I just kind of lifted my left hand up like, you know, hey, I'm I'm no threat. I just lifted it up. And when I did that, it looked directly at me. And then it turned slightly to the left and started, he took, two steps and covered 15 feet and got the tree that he was closely beside in between me and him. And he directly started walking away. And I'm still sitting there thinking, what am I looking at? And as he stepped away, I mean, it was, his head never moved. It stayed completely level. As he stepped away, it it was a freakish kind of movement that he made. He stepped away, got that tree in between me and him, and took four or five more steps, and there was a fork right there in the tree, just a little above above his head. But the ground was kind of moving uphill slightly away from me, and I caught one more glimpse of him between those forks of that tree. And I could hear him. But shortly after that, I couldn't see him no more, and I wasn't moving. I mean, I was was just left and, you know, like, what in the hell is that? And he walked away. And I just sat there. I mean, I stood there for a moment, you know, wondering what in the – and I'm still, my dog getting nowhere around. And I'm thinking, where in the hell did River go, you know? He walked away, went out of hearing. I didn't see him no more. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, 
you know, is all this stress that I've been under and everything. I, I mean, you know, I was really just baffled about what I'd saw. And I turned, uh, I started walking back to the truck after I gained my composure. And I was just, I was feeling so bad. I didn't know, I didn't know what the feeling was I was feeling. And I got back to the truck and my dog was there at the truck. I, I mean, usually he stays with me right from the beginning, but he was there back at the truck. And, uh, time I opened the door, he just jumped in. I mean, he was, usually you got to coax him in the truck. I mean, but he was right there in the truck. He's like, we're out of uh, here. <laughs> yeah, we're out of here. I mean, he's like gone. I mean, he's a chocolate cocker spaniel. And I mean, usually he, I mean, he's a very, he's very protective over me and my wife, Kathy. I mean, he's, I mean, anything, he just raises his cane at. He never, I never heard him bark or nothing. But he was there at that truck and he wanted to get in it. And I just sat there at that truck. And, and the feeling that I felt, I mean, I wanted it was like I was wanting to get sick, you know, and I couldn't understand it. It was like I wasn't in fear at the time. And when I had talked to you earlier, you know, I, I went back and I started thinking, and I can remember the one time I felt that way. And I know, I mean, people may say, well, God, this, this guy's, you know, he's really going back searching for stuff, but it's the honest to God truth. The only time I remember ever feeling that way, I was 14, 13 or 14, and I was allowed to go to a Saturday night party that a girl had, and some people there had some pot. And I grew up in kind of a, you know, a Southern Baptist home, and, you know, you you was supposed to be a good boy. That kind of stuff was taboo, and I took a puff off a joint, and I ain't kidding you. I, I had to almost get help because I felt like I had done something so wrong when I took that puff off that joint. I mean, really. I mean, I I can remember the sickening feeling I got because I felt like I had done something. My grandmother, who raised me, you know, growing up in a split family, she, she raised me. And I thought I had done something bad. And that's the same feeling I'd had when I saw this creature. and. I, you know, when I finally came around it, there was just something wrong about seeing him. It was, it was just so wrong. When I saw him, it just felt so wrong. I, you know, I just, I didn't know what to think about it. Yeah. And no, I mean, I was, it's kind of shocking. It's been, shocking oh, it's, I mean, it was absolutely shocking in it. Yeah. But the thing about it, I've heard people talk about getting sick and everything. And I, and you know, and when I talked to you last, I was trying to put things together, but, that was the best way for me to describe the way I felt. I felt like it was wrong. It was just wrong for me to be there and to see that. It wasn't like he was overly frightening. When he when he looked at me, I didn't feel like he was fixing to charge me or nothing like that. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I grew up, my daddy and granddaddy both were gunsmiths and you know, I grew up hunting, and I've been in the woods, God, there's no telling how many times. There's no telling how many deer and stuff I've killed. When I saw him, the feeling I got after that experience was that was wrong. It was just wrong, you know, for me to have seen him or to experience that. Like I said, I never felt like, I mean... I, like I said, I grew up, you know, hunting and everything, and, and yeah. I knew I had a I had a shotgun with five loads in it, and I'm a pretty good shot. And you know, I didn't feel threatened so far as that, or maybe I should have been. I don't know. Yeah, but, it doesn't seem like it. From what you're telling me, it kind of seems like he was just he was just kind of on his way. He was in between, you know. Or um, I think I wandered up on him and. Really, so far as what I hear about people with infrasound and all, I don't think any of that played a part. But he, I kind of stumbled upon him, you know, like he did upon me. And the one thing that I can say, if anybody ever asked, he knew what that gun was. When I stepped out and he saw that gun, he knew what it was. He nailed in on it. I mean, he looked right 
down at it. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel like there was no need to throw up, you know, or take a defensive stance. I just, I don't know why I did it. I don't know why. I, to this yeah. day, I, I just threw my hand up like, you know, like an Indian would, you know, hey, peace, let's, yeah. you know. No, I get no, it. Yeah, I mean, and I think that was smart doing that. And you're probably right. He probably did know what that gun was. Um, I'm curious, what did he look like? Can you describe him for the audience? The best description that I have given, you know, that I've told my friends and I've told everybody else, uh, and this is honest to God truth, Carrie, or, or Carrie from Odyssey, Bigfoot Odyssey, he yeah. gave a description of the one that he saw. Now, it wasn't per se exactly like the one he saw, but it was very, very close. He was dark, dark haired. He wasn't black, but he was dark, dark haired. And the skin on his face, which was exposed, it was dark, like a dark charcoal gray. Uh, nose uh, prominent, but it wasn't like a gorilla flat. I mean, it did, it had a bridge to it, and, you know, it, it, it wasn't exactly on the end of it sticking out, but it wasn't exactly flat. And big, dark, dark, almost, and I am colorblind, so I can't distinguish between red and, like, bright orange. They kind of look the same to me. But, you know, dark, dark colors, they kind of look the same. And his eyes were very, very dark. I mean, like black, dark, dark brown. And I did not see any white around him. But I could tell when he was looking at me or looking at that gun, big mouth. I mean, that's the one thing I remember because that's the first thing I saw was his lips moving like he was chewing something. I mean, like moving it from side to side. He never, I never saw any teeth. Uh, but. That's the picture I saw. The best, you know, when Kerry said that this was what he saw, that's what it kind of looked like, except it wasn't quite as dark in the face as what he saw. And it just had the appearance that, you know, I didn't think about it at the time of being, you know, evil or anything like that. It just, after the circumstances, I, I, I felt like it was just wrong for me to have seen it. That's, that's just the way I felt. I felt like it was bad for me to see it. I didn't get, you know, sick for three or four days. I just felt bad, a dreadful, like I had seen something I wasn't supposed to. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. And I, and I think it's fascinating, the whole interaction that you guys had. I mean, really, there was no aggression. Uh, he was probably just as surprised to see you as you were to him. And, and that's what I thought. when I, When he looked at me, that's what I thought, like, I stumbled up on him like, uh, you know, maybe he stumbled up on me. I mean, like what? I mean, that's the, the that's what I thought when I looked at him. The first thing I thought, there's two things I thought. My daddy had always told me that there was no animal in North America that is that you should fear. Everything fears you. And when I saw him, that's the first two things I thought. I said, Daddy, where are you at now? I mean, I can remember him saying this just like it was yesterday. I mean, he, you know, I was like, what would you say now? And, you know, I thought, you know, I was a surprise to him like he was to me. I mean, it was just, he. I mean, the, the first thing his expression said was, what the hell are you doing here? You know, yeah, and, and, and I, th I think if you would have pulled that gun up, I think it would have turned south. I think that him looking down at it and kind of looking back. I believe him. that. I believe yeah. that. I, I mean, I, I do. I mean, he was really zeroed in on that. I mean, he, he, he just, I mean, he would like look at it and then he'd look back at my face to see what I'm thinking. Like, are you fixing to pull this up? And the moment that I lifted my hand like that, I mean, it's almost like this joker was thinking what I was thinking. And I don't know what to think about that. I mean, if this is an animal, if this is a, 
if this is something that's supposed to be an animal, a flesh and blood animal, and I'm not saying there was nothing telepathically there, you know what I'm saying? That he's thinking what I'm thinking, but if, if that kind of expression he's giving me, and I'm reading that, what the hell is this? I mean, it was like, you know, he was thinking what I was doing. Like he knew when I lifted my hand that I wasn't going to do anything defensively. I mean, what is this? Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say. I mean, and, and you're right. I, I think... Uh, you know, most primates, and I'm not saying it's like a monkey or, well, you know, a great ape or some sort, but, uh, you know, even most primates recognize what you're doing, you know, and they, they keen in on it. Even your dog knows what you're doing. Uh, there's time, oh, yeah. I'm sure you could look at, what was his name, River? Yeah, yeah my dog, River, a cool, Cocker Spaniel. Yeah, cool name. Uh, even your dog knows when you're upset, knows when you're happy, knows when you're sad, and, you know, it's not hard to... I, I think for animals and humans to pinpoint, to look at another creature or whatever you want to say and, and know what its intentions are. And, you know, I, I can see how you wouldn't say evil because really it wasn't doing anything. Uh, I think yeah. a lot of times when people say evil, it's very easy to come to that conclusion when one's rushing you or growling at you or roaring at you and throwing stuff at you. Uh, you know, you, evil seems to come to mind, but they don't, not all of them act that way. I mean, it's no, pretty, they don't. Hit, pretty and, hit and, and miss. I've, I've listened to a lot of your uh, podcast uh, since, and I mean, even during that time, because I, me and my sister's uh, daughters, they were nine years old when she passed away, and I would go down frequently in Savannah and visit them, and one of them, you know, she was just, there ain't no such thing, you know, and the other one, the one that was more like the hill side of the family, you know, my side. She was like, yeah, you know, we'll go research them. You know, she's just always into it. And I always cut up with them, you know, about that. That's really what, you know, got me into it. I mean, we were just looking through some YouTube stuff that day. And uh, we ran across some videos and we were looking at them. And, you know, some of them were pretty credible. I mean, I thought, I mean, some of them, you know, were definitely, I thought, I don't know about that, you know. but. I was just always been kind of a skeptic, you know, yeah, I just I get didn't, it. I get it. I just, you know, I just never had, I mean, I've been God, I've been hunting since I was 14 years old. I mean, you know, you just never know about that. And yeah. And, and you know, that's why I'm not hard on hunters who are hardcore skeptics where they say, well, I've been out, never heard anything, never saw anything. I get it. <laughs> it was the same way at one time. I mean, I've yeah. been all over Washington, up in the hills and everywhere, never heard anything, God, never saw anything. Some you know. of the most best hunting in the world up there. I mean, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, around here, you know, you're either hunting deer or, I mean, I can remember during a time where I would go coon hunting. I mean, I had coon hounds. We would go during the nights, and I never thought nothing about it. But there were some things that happened when I look back on it. I mean, I just... I don't know whether I should relate it to that or not, you know? And Yeah, I understand. I understand. A lot of times you look back, even on weird things that happen, you're like, hmm, that's strange. Especially after yeah, having an encounter, you know. It was. Uh, I mean, I can remember times when I was deer hunting out on my dad's place, and it, it, it got a lot of history to it. I mean, it there's still the old log cabin where in 1700 and something, my great, great, great grandparents settled that land the, the log cabin still standing i mean a hewn log cabin got wood pegs you know to connect the logs three walls are still standing and they had musket holes where they shot indians out of and i mean there there were stories you know about stuff through the years and i've had people in my family who dedicated their life to hunting and one was you know my uncle dave newell and uh, around Homosassa, Florida, Leesburg, he uh, he hunted the Willacoochee uh, National Forest down there in River Basin. And uh, he was editor of Field and Stream for years. And uh, I can remember him telling my dad in the, in the 70s, because he was up in age then, but he was telling my dad about some things. And there was a creature that 
he had seen the tracks of and all and when i look back on it that's what he was talking about i mean he had run into the so-called skunk ape down there uh he was even one of the last people to take annie oakley uh hunting on a hunting a hunting trip there oh very cool and you can yeah you can you can google that up david m newell he's he's in there i mean he was editor and field and stream from about 1940 to 1945 and then sports afield and yeah it's a yeah, cool we, it's a cool history we were, to have yeah yeah we were real close and but i just you know i mean growing up like i did i mean and my dad telling me i can remember you know sitting in front of my grandmother and granddaddy's big screen uh television back in those days I can remember seeing the Patterson and Gimlin film and that thing walking across there. And my daddy said, that ain't nothing no more than a guy in a monkey suit. And I can remember later on, uh, something came up on National Geographic or something. And daddy said, there it is again. And I said, well, daddy, let me ask you this. I done got, you know, 19 or 20 then. I said, where in the hell is that suit? I mean, you keep talking about a man in a suit. Where is that suit? Nobody has proven that to be a hoax. Where is that suit? Because I'm sure during that time, and I told him that then, I said, that was during the time when Hollywood and stuff was in its infancy. I mean, the Planet of the Apes should come out. And I think later on, Gerald Meldrum Meldrum brought that up. That, you know, where is that suit? I mean, where is it? Nobody has been able to defute that. So yeah. this thing has, you know, been around, uh, and there's been no suit to prove that it was a guy in a suit. You know, it's just been a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of things to rack somebody's brain about it. I mean, if you look up the the history of, you know, the Indians and proclaiming to see it, I've just, it's just baffled me, you know. Yeah, well, and, uh, now, you, now you know they're out there. I mean, you look at historical accounts, but there's nothing nothing to compare to being eye-to-eye with one. No, there's just nothing. It, you know. I mean, you know it's there. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't know whether I feel lucky for seeing one or whether, you know, it's something I need to take in consideration about myself. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't know. It, it, I mean, it's bothered me, and I mean, that's one reason it's taken me since February to the contact. I mean, I've listened to a lot of things. I mean, it's nothing that I just jumped up on. Uh, I've listened to a lot of accounts and a lot of people. And I guess the biggest reason that, you know, I thought to contact you was that, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to blow you up or discredit anybody, but, you know, you have the most credible witnesses and the way you go about your show of, trying to get this out i mean it's i mean and that's just a fact i mean it's there's the first time i heard your show i thought this has got to be real because there's nothing at all except witness testimony and he's not plundering anybody for anything that they didn't see and you know that's one thing that i've just always been you know i'm i'm all about you know real how somebody really saw things and and uh what's real and that's one thing that's been kind of a, a trouble to me about some of these other uh people that broadcast i mean and not saying that they're not telling the truth i mean i'm not saying that at all but you know like and god i love them to death they tell a great story baron kumbo they tell some great great things you know what i'm saying but it, I mean, yeah. I just don't see how anybody could listen to them. And it's like, it's like a coon hunt every other night. How could you experience that and it not have no more effect on you? I mean, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I just, I just wonder, I mean, have, has it been around that long and been that accustomed to them like that? Because that would scare the hell out of me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to say. They're they're good guys. Baron Kumbo are good guys. Yeah, they're great guys. I love Baron them. I mean, but you know, I mean, if it's been around that long, I really don't know what to say. I mean, you know, I really, I mean, because like I said, I've I've been around and I did have an encounter, and it was just like the things they saw. And if they're seeing that Joker that I saw that much, 
I just, I don't want to, I mean, I just don't believe I could go out again and see it. They've got <laughs> yeah. to really be devoted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm with you. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm I know you. he's there. I've seen it, you know, and it just scares the hell out of me for them to think that they're going out. They, they look at it like he's just a booger, you know. Well, booger or nothing. I mean, that son of a bitch scared the hell out of me. I mean, after I thought about it and know everything, and it walked off, and I was left in awe. I didn't know what to think. I, you know, I mean, it'll it'll definitely stick with you for a long time. I mean, it'll stick with you the rest of your life, to be honest with you. And it is a terrifying account. I mean, they're all terrifying, really, even when they're not aggressive, because it's like you said, the shock kicks in. You know, your adrenaline. It's an adrenaline dump. Yeah, I mean, it was after the fact. After I got back, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, I was sick, and I got to thinking. I've heard about everybody like, and I just kept thinking about it being wrong and the only thing i could tell you about was you know my grandma telling me you stay away from them kind of things you know you don't get around and when i took a puff off that joint i felt so guilty and that's the same way i felt and i just wondered you know what level of wrong am i dealing with right here is this something you know is this thing something demonic or is it is it just wrong for me to see it i I didn't know i mean i still don't know i don't know you know, I I don't know what this thing is. I mean, if I could say what it was, I mean, the first thing, you know, after I really thought about it was it's just not supposed to be here. It's, it's not. It's really not. I mean, at first, you know, like I said, it is a flesh and blood creature. I saw it. I know that it's there. But is it supposed to be here? I don't know. I mean, I really yeah. don't. I hear you. I hear you, and I, and I appreciate you taking the time to come on and share it and all the kind words you said about uh, the show. Thank you for that. And yeah, you know, any, the, I mean, your questions are my questions, man. There, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of questions out there, but um, I really appreciate coming on, Rob. Thank you so much, Wes. And, I mean, anything that I can do to help you or anybody else out, I'd be glad. I mean, because you all have helped me out a lot. I mean, just that these things are out there and – and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, isolated. And I really appreciate it. I mean, I really do. And y'all, you've just, y'all, you and your podcast and all your witnesses, everybody, y'all have helped me out a lot. I mean, you, you've really given credibility to something that people didn't want to give credibility to. And I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of the show, 4 slash Sasquatch. Very cool website. Did you know 66% of men lose their hair by the age 35? I think that's about the time I start shaving my head. That's when you really start to notice hair loss. And by that time, it's too late. It's easier to keep the hair that you have than replace the hair that you've lost. 4 forward slash Sasquatch is a one-stop place for hair loss, skincare, sexual wellness, all for men. A lot of cool products on the site. And for you ladies out there listening, definitely check it out for your man. 4 forward slash Sasquatch. The really cool part is 4 forward slash Sasquatch connects you with real doctors, medical grade solutions uh, to treat for hair loss, It's not like snake oil. They actually have real treatment for this. There's no waiting room, no awkward doctor visits. Save hours by going to 4 forward slash Sasquatch. It's so easy. What else do you need? Answer a few questions. A doctor will review it and will prescribe to you products that will be shipped directly to your door. Order now. My listeners get a free trial of Hems just for $5 today. Check out the website for full details and safety information. This would cost hundreds of dollars if you went to the doctor or pharmacy. Go to 4 forward slash Sasquatch. That's 4 forward slash Sasquatch. F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com forward slash Sasquatch. And uh, even beyond hair loss, they got a lot of cool products on there. So definitely check it out, guys. Get a little skincare for yourself. You know what I'm talking about? I want to thank uh, 4 for sponsoring the show. 
Let's jump back into it tonight. I want to welcome Howard to the show. Howard, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem, Wes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I appreciate you being here. And I know your encounter happened in uh, Oklahoma, didn't it? Yeah, it happened in um, Oklahoma. Actually, it would be in the Cherokee County, um, Tahlequah region. Oh, very Here's cool. Kind of the kind of the north, uh, be the, the northeast, close to Arkansas. Right? I got it's you. Right on that, that Arkansas border. So. I got you. Well, if you would take us back uh, to that moment, uh, I'm real curious to hear the full encounter. Uh, take us back okay. to that moment, and and if you would, just kind of walk us into what happened. What were you doing, and and what happened? Well, this was probably right around. <laughs> 82, 83, <clears throat> my brother and I were, we're a couple years apart in age, but my mother was adopted and she came from, you know, California, Washington, all those regions out there. And this family here adopted her. So they were settled in Tahlequah. Uh, their gr- grandfather, Pete was a Cherokee Indian and, and a very prominent, um, Cher- part of the Cherokee tribe. And we would go visit, you know, during the summer, she would go up and check on her adopted parents. And it was always a really good time at places just a paradise for any kid to go play around. You could see the Illinois River from their house. It's it's more beautiful. But where they lived was pretty much back up, back up in the woods quite a ways. But there were, I would say, six houses along that way. And it's all uh, Native American housing, you know, all Indian housing. Grandpa Pete and them, theirs was at the end of the road. And they had their, their cabin that they lived in. And then there was one behind it. And... I was, say, 11. It hadn't been that long since my mother was there that they had moved out of the one behind. It had no running water. I mean, they, they were still living very primitive. But you could go right through to the back cabin, and the river was right below there, and that's where we would typically always go play. Well, my brother and I happened to be back in that area one day, and it went – I'm trying to see if I can describe this. You know, you'd have a, a line of trees, and then there was an opening, kind of like a little sandbar, you know, right there to the river, and then, then a line of trees. And my brother noticed what we assume is a man. Wes, I do not know if a Bigfoot exists. You know, I can't ever say that I do. So we looked down there, and my brother's like, hey, what's that guy doing down there? And then it took me a little bit to zone in on him, and he was. And it was a large man. I will say man. You know, I don't know. And we're down there. Well, that's our grandpa's property. So being kids, we're like, hey. And so in my infinite wisdom, I decide to yell at the guy. I yell. This thing turns, faces us, and that's when it let out a scream. And the scream, it wasn't the best way I can describe it, is the sounds that the big thicket guys, you know, record that, just that that scream. It's just, you know, it's it wasn't, wasn't deep. It wasn't a groan. It, you know, it wasn't a growl. I mean, this was a scream. It screamed and took off, which would be basically taking off back to the west along the other tree line and then disappeared. Well, you know, we're sitting here thinking, what in the world just happened? And it wasn't a couple of minutes and the neighbor come running around there and he rushed us back into the cabin. We're in the cabin and he's in there telling my grandfather what's going on. They're speaking Cherokee to each other. So we're told not to go back outside. but pretty much what our grandfather said was we're not allowed to go back there right now because they're just passing through what he meant by that statement. We don't know. So you know, he, he always, you know, I think he knew something being living in that area his whole life. I mean, he's literally lived there his entire life. So, you know, in around that area, you always hear stories and we grew up coon hunting down in Atoka County. You know, and down there, it's it's a constant. Uh, you'll hear it all the time. They call it the Red Eye Devil. You'll hear just what's, what's it called? All kinds of stories. What's the Red Eye Devil. Oh, I get you. I got you. Yeah, that's what they call it in that Atoka region, Atoka antlers. But if I can tell you, this isn't very far. Are you familiar with uh, Mena, Arkansas? No, I'm not. I'm okay, really not. it's not real far from that region, um, Texarkana, Texas. Yeah, yeah, I know that okay. area. Really not very far from there. I mean, Atoka is literally, you can be down there probably an hour. So, you know, it just runs up through that region. And it's real swampy. That's where the Boggy Creek's at. Remember the Boggy Creek monster? Yeah, of course. Yeah. The legend of Boggy Creek. It Well, well, there's two Boggies. There's Muddy and there's Clear. And Muddy runs through Atoka. I'm curious. So. Did he did he ever go into any more details as nope. far as? Wouldn't, he wouldn't. And, you know, of course, me being a kid, 
I kind of quizzed him a little bit, you know, and, and I'd always ask him, but you know, at the time, <laughs> exposure to Bigfoot, there was no internet, you know, at, at my age at that time. So exposure to any type of uh, Sasquatch or anything like that was really, I mean, like I said, the only thing we had was the legend of Boggy Creek, the movie, which scared the bejesus out of any kid, you know? So, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious. I want to hear more about this man and what I find fascinating about you calling it a man. I mean, a man's not going to turn around and scream like that and then uh, take off. But one question I want to ask you, when it took off, how fast did it take off? Was it like oh, a man? It, or? It, 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 yeah. Oh, no, it was. I mean, it, okay. If I can just uh, describe it and, and you know, remember, I'm trying to remember this the best I can. Yeah. I mean, when I yelled at it, it, it's back was to us. Okay. So it was right there at the river. When I yelled, I mean, this thing on a dime turns and just like, you know, rah, just as loud as it could at us. And I mean, it bolted. And when it ran, it was gone. I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy now, you know, it wasn't then, but I mean, this thing just, it looked enormous and it just took off in a flash. But the crazy part about it was, and we, that's the part, and you know, my mother, we had had the discussion, you know, years and years after and we've always, my brother and I've always brought the story up to each other, you know, but the neighbor literally looked scared when he came around the corner. And, and I wish I could remember his name because he was a younger guy. He's probably still alive living in that region. Yeah. It, but, it, you know, it's so fascinating because, you know, it, with regard to these creatures, you know, they always say, oh, the Native Americans, they're, they're our forest brother. Or not no. necessarily the Native Americans say that, but I mean, people who think they know what the Native Americans think will go, oh, you know, the Native Americans think that they're our forest brothers. And that's not really true. Not from very many Native Americans I've talked to. That's not true at all. And for your grandfather, if it was a friendly forest brother out there, he'd have been like, yeah. oh, you're fine, go out and play. But for him not to allow you to leave the home... And say they're passing through. I mean, obviously, your grandfather wa was worried about it. Well, that's and that's what you know. And even my mother, and of course, my mother is is an adopted child, but she's as bad as they are about not speaking of things. You know, you just don't talk about certain things. And that's was our big concern because we had the rest of the weekend, and we literally had to stay basically in the um, in, in the corridor of the houses to play. We weren't allowed to go to the woods, so. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, you called a man, because I remember one time a lady contacted me and said, well, I ran into this strange man, and she was describing it. She said, yeah, he had a big fur coat on, and he turned around and roared at me and then ran off. And I was like, that doesn't sound like a man. Um, it, was there any details that you remember? I realize we're going back like 40 years you know, on this thing, but was there any details you remember from, from being there? Well, the only uh, detail, I mean, as far, you know, because I could see no facial features. You, you know, you're looking, this was 100 yards probably plus, you know, down to the water. So you're not going to see much detail at that point. But I remember the color of, of the guy, and he was like all in buckskin. It, or if you're familiar, you know, with uh, what a buckskin color yeah. is. And it, and it was like a deer, but I mean, he was just, but it was all one color. I mean, he didn't have a jacket. Yeah, you know, I mean, because usually no one matches your jacket to your pants, especially. And this was the middle of summer. So why would he be fully dressed? And especially if you're at the, at the river, because there are a lot of uh, people canoeing up and down the Illinois. And they will stop and get out on the sandbars, you know, and hang out, drink beer, whatever. But they're in shorts. You know, you can, you can, tell, a, a, you can tell a white man. You can tell an African-American man. But this was all one color. It's like I told you, I really have no idea. It was just always, always a very unique experience. Yeah, it is. Did you ever go back to that property? And did anything we, else ever happen? We've never been back. Uh, we went back one, in a couple of years, we went back up there. And then my grandmother passed away. And then we lost contact with Grandpa Pete. And he, he passed away, you know, years later. But like I said, you know, the dyna dynamics of the whole being an adopted child and yada, yada, yada. But we did have cousins who lived in that region that we would still stay in touch with every now and then. And I have some, some cousins around my age and as children, they always made a joke about the cave at the top of the mountain. And apparently there is a cave in Telequah that people can see from up there, but I, I don't know anybody who goes up and looks and who knows, you know, it's probably just a kid's tale. Did you ever, did you ever talk to your brother? That that you were with about about this whole thing? 
Yeah, well, this, that's really strange. My brother uh, actually lived in Texarkana for quite some time. Um, fairly, fairly successful guy. And his neighbor uh, was a U.S. Marshal. And I typically don't like to tell other people's stories, you know what I mean, because that just, you know, that, that's their story. But his neighbor was a U.S. Marshal. Um, really, really neat guy. And I had went down to visit. We were joking um, at dinner one evening. You know, I'm like, well, you guys aren't very far from, you know, the Bigfoot movie and all this right here. And he relayed a story of a partner of his who was a U.S. Marshal himself. And he was, you know, getting ready to retire, but he was a big deer hunter. And he went down to what they call a slough. Are you familiar what a slough is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it went down to a slough. And, I, and I've done this same routine myself as a hunter. You get there, it's dark. Man, you really don't want to go walk out there and climb in a deer stand. You want to kind of wait so you can see, you know, a little bit. And he decided to do that, sat in his truck, was drinking his coffee. And as the sun started to come up, he got out of his truck. And he said he opened up, you know, his door to get out. And he had a truck. It's not a double cab. You always had that little small door. And he opened up the side door to get his rifle out. And he said at that time, deer just come out of everywhere, flowing across the road. He thought, man, you know, I've missed my opportunity. I've missed my shot. But he said what was behind that, he'll never forget. And now this is what he does. I never met the man, never got to meet the man. But all he does now is look for, and, and, and you know, this guy is a U.S. Marshal here at Center Tell us this. And he said, 100%, it exists, it's real. He said, this thing hit the road, two steps was across, didn't even bother looking at him. He was chasing the deer. So Yeah, that's fascinating. A lot of times you know, when, uh, I think, well, you know what's interesting, Howard, is how deer react. Do you know a deer's going to leave from you at any cost? They're not going to stick around humans. But when when these things are around, it's like Mike Woolley's encounter. You know, what's a deer do? It comes right up to his deer stand, puts his head down. It's almost like they know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in, in here in Oklahoma, uh, I was, you know, thinking about this after we had briefly talked yesterday. You know, in Oklahoma, every game warden we have, one, you know, nothing like that exists. And also, too, we don't have mountain lions or panthers here. Okay, that's, that's always the rule of thumb. I've seen a panther twice out hunting. Yeah. And we call them panthers. They're black. I think they're just a black, you know, cougar. But game wardens, oh, they don't exist, don't exist until what happened? A man in Minko, Oklahoma ran over one. And yeah. then there's the body. There's the proof. So then suddenly the story in Oklahoma changed. Well, they are migrating down, you know, and we're getting a small cat migrating up from uh, the Mexico kind of area, too. So, yeah, I was, like I said, I, 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 I'm one of those people, I think once the, someone sees the body, then we'll. Oh, then suddenly, oh, well, we've believed it all along, you know. We've known about this. Yeah, that's probably how it's going to go down, which is hilarious to me. But it would be nice if that would happen. Like, I was telling you the other day, and, and people don't like me saying that, but I'm all for uh, one of these things being shot. I'm all for someone dragging it out. Now, whether it'll actually get to the public or not, it's a different story. But... Mm -hmm. You know, and same thing with Panthers. I always wonder why game wardens, they do that in other states too. I can think of many on the East Coast where they say, oh, Panthers don't exist. And I've talked to hunters and they're like, yeah, they're out there. Or they'll say, we don't have any large cats. And it's like, yeah, they're out there. You know, go ask a hunter. Don't go ask a game warden because he's going to give you BS. Go straight to a hunter. He's going to tell you they're out there. Uh, oh, yeah. I, and then in this region too. And here is... Uh, one of the stranger parts that Atoka County area down there. And, and like I said, my, uh, I had another brother who's big, big coon hunter, but he describes several times being really scared in the woods. And, you know, we are outdoorsmen. We're hunters. We don't really get spooked a whole lot. I mean, cats spook me. I mean, they do. When I saw that, you know, I saw a panther, it spooked me because those things are very sleek and very, you know, they could be on you before you know it. But, you know, down in that area down there, they actually have more game wardens in that County than they have in the other counties because of all the hunting that takes place down there. And there's a huge warehouser forestry division down there. That's one thing a lot of people don't realize. Warehouser owns a ton of property in that area. So I, if me, I would look at the financial aspects of finding an animal of this nature and what it would do to affect the forestry industry or, you know, any other type of thing. Because unfortunately we do get everybody who is a bleeding heart. You know, I don't, I hate to use the term liberal for, but they cry over everything. Right. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating, especially down there. I get so many reports from Oklahoma and it's like I was telling you the other night, uh, Oklahoma is very, 
it reminds me of like um, Maine, Vermont, uh, those those states in the sense that when you talk to people, they'll tell you personal, they'll tell you privately what they've seen, but they don't want to go on the air, they don't want to talk about it publicly, and they'll tell friends and family, and rarely will they talk to an outsider as far as what's going on. But there's a ton going on in Oklahoma. Yeah, like I said, well, but also too, you know, we've had several shows here and we discussed that, but the problem is, and unfortunately, you know, for this type of environment, they, for some odd reason, it seems like cameras go and find the biggest idiots they can find, you know, and cause it makes the legitimate crowd within this community, you know, look silly or incredible. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's annoying to see how some things are portrayed. You know, no, I know it fits, but you know, it's like the finding Bigfoot guys. I mean, I, as a hunter, I'm not going to walk out in the woods with a, a camera six foot in front of my face, a light, a bat, and go stomping around. I mean, if I want to, if I want to go kill something, then I do it as I'm hunting. I mean, if you're looking for something, you you just don't go announce yourself. So right, you stay like a ghost in the woods. <laughs> you got to. I mean, I like I said, I I know nothing about the subject other than, you know, discovering your show and, and really enjoying it. It's a, it's really interesting to listen to some of these people because you have such legit people on here. They're, you know, they don't, they don't come across as crazy or unbelievable. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, and I think it's part of the way of changing or giving it a legitimacy because, you know, I could come on here and talk for, I mean, no one's going to sit and listen to me talk for an hour, but I could come on here and cram down Bigfoot down everyone's throats. No one's going to care after a while. Uh, but yeah. if you listen to people who've experienced it, you'll stop and listen. You know what I mean? You'll stop and really go. Even I've had so many people contact me and say, I don't believe in Bigfoot, but that guy saw something. That woman saw something. That hunter saw something. That play. And after a while, it's like, well, if they, what do you think they saw? What is it you think these people are seeing? And I think that's really the way of changing the legit. You're not going to do it through finding Bigfoot. And those are good guys. And I have nothing against those guys or uh, anything like that. But what I'm saying is you're not going to do it through like mountain monsters and finding Bigfoot and uh, or researchers coming on and talking about their theories and buy my book and blah, 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 blah. No one cares. But if you stop, you'll listen to someone tell their story and say, hey, this happened to me. After a while, I mean, God, I've done 500 plus shows. After a while, these people are seeing something. Whether you believe in Bigfoot or not, it's irrelevant to me. These people are seeing something like you saw something, Howard. And, you know, what really, what is it? <laughs> what is out there? And that's the questions. And I really think that's how you get to the heart of what's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. That was the confusing part about what I saw because clearly upright, clearly on two legs arm movement. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not looking at a bear. I am, you know, we don't have, we have bear. It's really funny. We have bear in Oklahoma and it's the craziest thing. We've actually had one show up in the central part of the state out of nowhere. And it, it wasn't a really big bear, but it just, you know, they did. I like any other creature, they go where they want, you know? So yeah. I, I, yeah, I, there's no I, state lines. I will never say that I, no, 100% that something like that exists, but I'm, I'm in the same theory that you are this many people throughout the course of time. And we go back to a president who writes about this, you know, and every native American culture, especially here in Oklahoma being very, you know, I am native American. A lot, everybody here in Oklahoma is pretty much native American, but every tribe has this. So where did it come from? Where did it generate from? Was yeah. there a, was there a, a single Native American back in time who said, you know what? I'm just going to tell people I saw a big monkey and then right. we're just going to spread that rumor. You know, that, <laughs> just, well, rumors die over time. Yeah, you know, legends don't, but rumors die over time. And I think, uh, you know, you're right. You talk to a lot of, I mean, even here in Washington state, you talk to a lot of Native Americans and you'll get different stories and it really depends. And what I find fascinating about it is you'll get different, you, you'll get a different a perspective on the creature depending on the tribe you talk to some of them say hey they won't harm you leave them alone and they'll leave you alone other tribes you know they're like kill them all it's very interesting it depends on the tribe that and their perspective their interactions with these things and that's how they'll tell you about the creature and god i wish pete was still alive i'd love to talk to that guy 
Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you, he was the, and I hate, he was the quintessential Indian. And when I say that, his looks, his features, I mean, I remember the man's face, you know, and, and luckily for me, I got to experience him at some point as a grandfather. But he was uh, just a, he was that wise, he was that wise Indian who, uh, he was just enjoy to be around, you know, and, and just to go out in the woods with. He he was very knowledgeable about everything. But, you know, my, my deal, uh, whole take on it is, you know, everybody says, well, we would have shot one, we would have done this, we would have done that. Well, I don't know that they haven't been shot. And the other side of it, too, is if I wanted to disappear, even in Oklahoma, I could disappear. There's enough out there, you know, and if this thing ha uses a intelligence level to where it can has rational thought, it's not hard to avoid people. It, it's really not. I think I think when people do have their experiences, maybe they they're more curious than we are. And so that's where they get seen. So I, theories only. So, yeah, I hear you. What, what do you think yeah. that they are? Pete, or I almost said Pete. Howard, what, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that they are, Howard? Sorry about that. Um, I would probably have to go the Gigantopithecus theory, I think would I would lean more towards that because, uh, you know, and now that, now that uh, you've got me on this kick of researching all the time, you know, and reading, love to read, but, uh, and I'm noticing the differences between like the East Texas ones and, and the aggression that, that I, you know, was listening to about how they are versus what you have there, you know, up in the, up in the Northwest, they seem a little more docile. I, I honestly, I, I would not have an answer. I don't know that it's an, an ape or it's a missing link, but who knows? I truly have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. It would, it would be nice to know. It, it really is a fascinating account, you know, and, and uh, I think, um, I, I think it's interesting. You screamed at it. You're like, Hey, what are you doing down here? You know, and the thing turns around and screams at you and yeah. takes off and, uh, you probably surprised it probably wasn't expecting you guys to be there, you know, and, and yelling at it, it kind of turned and, it's fascinating, man. It's really fascinating, yeah. especially you and describe the color and the, how fast it moves. Well, that's what I mean. Those are the things that you 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 know stick out in your mind and remember. And you know, this is funny. But we're going into that time of year, and this is a this is a thought that has stayed with me my entire child. I mean, geez, I forgot you know who my first girlfriend was and everything in the world. But that's one thing you have never forgot is that that experience and not ever knowing. That's the part that kills me is not knowing. You know, what did you truly see? So. Yeah, it'll probably stick with you for a while, for the rest of your <laughs> life, you know. Well, I'll, I will tell you this, though, too, because I've hunted everywhere. I mean, we, we travel to Colorado and everywhere and hunt, but I always have that eye out. Does that make sense? I'm always yeah. like, okay. Always yourself, watching. Sure. Oh, well, yeah, I think you have to. But I didn't realize uh, some of the aggression that they have until I listened to your show. Some of these, some of these people have horrible experiences. Mine, no. And this wasn't something that was traumatic. It was just, hey, a childhood experience. This is what happened. But some of these people have some really traumatic experiences, and I feel for them because trauma to the, to the, to the mind is very difficult to ever erase. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Howard, and taking the time to uh, share your encounter. Thank you again. Well, I appreciate it, Wes. I enjoy the show. Thanks, Howard. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. You've got mail. Apparently, I have mail. Uh, well, you know, let's read a little fan mail. Nothing can get me down today. Um, no, it's written in all caps. That's never a good sign. Jim from uh, Kentucky says, Hey, Wes, you f I used to love the show, but I think you're a pile of now, and your musical choices on the show are ruining the show. Okay. Uh, he says that uh, he goes on and on. It's like the ramblings of a madman. Uh, f you, you f pile of shit. I hope you f die. Uh, what's he talking about here? If you ever play the Bee Gees or any form of it on your f show again, I'm gonna stop listening to you. F well, I wish Jimmy, I wish you'd really tell me how you feel. You need to come out of your shell, Jim. You know, you're spending too much time worrying about what other people think. You should just tell people how you feel, man. Uh, what else he say here? If you ever play that f Bee Gees song again, "Staying Alive" or any f version of it, 
I'm going to stop listening to your f- show. And I'm going to tell my friends and family to stop listening to your piece of sh- show. And pretty soon you have no listeners and you can go back to bouncing. You f- Oh, thank you, Jim. I appreciate the kind words. And, uh, you know, they, they charge me per bleat. So reading your email in there was actually kind of expensive. But, uh, you know, I can't afford to go lose any listeners. And I don't want to go back to second lumber. Uh, here's Pompeii 90, everyone.